conversation. We're going to be talking about building a diverse cybersecurity industry, a topic that is of great importance uh, to many of us. I've been having this conversation with lots of folks lately, and it's been a really great conversation. I am excited to have it be interactive here at the end where I can answer questions and hope that you take um, something away from this today that maybe you can implement in your workplace or if you're a hiring manager, you can start to look at things a little differently about how we bring in talent into our industry. Let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get started and where I, where I come from and why diversity is actually something I find really interesting. I have a quite diverse background when we think about cybersecurity. Well, I may hold certifications right now, the CISSP, the CISO, which I'm very proud of, and previously held many certs, CEH, CISA. The last one on the list is a certified fraud examiner prior to my getting into technology in 2005. That was my passion. I was really looking at law enforcement and um, looking at how to use my accounting degree in a way to do forensics, for forensic accounting or white collar crime investigations and didn't really know anything about information security. You see, I have a degree in accounting and a master's in computer forensics, which has a very small technical element, but we never discussed security or firewalls or routers or any of the stuff I need to know now as a security professional. And so my background is one of the diverse elements of what I bring to this industry. And one of the things we're going to talk about today, I've been working as a consultant and advisor now for quite a while, since 2005, a consultant. I've spent a little bit of time as an auditor, I've done a lot of assessments, uh, just a lot of security assessment work and advisory work. I'm really also very passionate about teams and leadership, especially in our space, what it takes to create a really high performing cybersecurity team, what it looks like to be an excellent cyber leader. And I went ahead and, and did some education around that as well to become a professional coach and really focus on leadership development, which is the focus of many of my talks when I speak in the industry. The theme for today is to think differently. And what I mean by that is how we hire for cybersecurity. I've looked at job descriptions over the years. I myself have been self-employed, I'm independent now, uh, but I still look at job descriptions. I'm still curious at what's out there for an opportunity. And the job descriptions are very interesting from the perspective that they're very technical. And we're gonna talk more about why I think that hampers diversity and where I think we can improve and how we write job descriptions and what we're really looking for. But from a strictly pragmatic perspective, we need to hire and think differently because we have a lot of open positions that we're thinking and predicting will be around for the next several years. I've heard the number of 1.5 million possible job openings in cyber by 2020 without enough people to fill that. So how do we, how do we get more people in those positions? Well, we have to look at it uh, from a diversity perspective, we don't. If we if we just stuck with the group of people that are really in the industry today, only 11% women. Obviously, the rest would then be made up of men. That's not enough people to fill the positions who would be interested in filling the positions. So, from a female perspective, we need more women who are going to be interested in cybersecurity to close the gap on those jobs that we know are coming. And also, from a female perspective people who think differently, lead differently, solve problems differently. And I think different is something we really need to focus on. Our adversaries are more than happy to put anyone in that position that can think and go after the target. We need to be able to do the same in terms of bringing in people who think differently. So I want that to be the theme for today and maybe even something you take with you from this from this talk today is, is the idea of thinking differently. So let's talk really about diversity. It's not just about bringing more women in. Of course, if we're gonna fill all those seats with qualified people, not just warm bodies, we do need to bring in more women and we'll talk a little bit about that. But when it comes to diversity, we're talking about obviously the male-female diversity, but there's ethnic diversity, there's age diversity, the boomers versus the millennial debate. 
which is fun to watch. The educational diversity, as I mentioned, my background is very different from what we would sometimes consider a traditional background for cyber. I don't have a computer science degree or any kind of technical background. So educational diversity, exper experiential diversity, the kind of jobs people have prior to coming into cybersecurity. I've talked to folks who are maybe halfway midpoint of their career. They've had a very su successful maybe IT career or audit career or something completely different. And now they're very interested in what this cyber thing is because we all know that it's well known now. What I did in 2005 when it was information security, nobody understood it outside the industry. But people now think cybersecurity is sexy and it's cool and the jobs are excellent. We know that. So how do we get others to join us and think differently? Right? Cognitive diversity, how we think um, are, are all different kinds of diversity that we need to bring in. So depending on where we're from, how we were raised, the kind of schooling we have, we're gonna look at problems differently. And if everyone on our team has the same background or a similar background, well, we're not gonna come up with all the possible solutions. Where we're raised, as I mentioned, when we were raised, the boomers versus millennials, lead us to think differently, solve problems, look at things at different angles. Technology that younger generation is more familiar with because they grew up with it, will lead them to solve problems differently. And we need that. We need to bring in people from different backgrounds. So we're gonna spend our time today talking about different types of diversity that I believe we need to build a strong cybersecurity industry. And as I mentioned, attackers don't have requirements. They're perfectly happy to bring anyone in that can do the job for them. Why don't we look at bringing people in differently as well? Education is one of those areas that you could tell I'm kind of passionate about because I was able to start in this industry without having a technical education, formal education background. Of course, we're gonna have people with technical backgrounds and education who are excellent and they should be considered. I'm not saying throw out all our technical, um, technically educated people from our candidate pool, not at all, we need them, but we also, too often, I think, assume that a job in cybersecurity requires technical experience or a computer science degree. And I think that happens very often with people who don't know what we do. We have people graduating with journalism degrees or human um, and science degrees, arts degrees, and they're looking for jobs. And those jobs aren't as prevalent as cybersecurity jobs, but they don't realize that they're qualified and they're also not being recruited. People aren't going to talk to them and let them know what that looks like to be someone who can write very well. Sometimes it's easier to teach a writer, a really skilled writer, what cybersecurity is and, and what teach them the job than it may be to take a very technical person and teach them how to write. We have to consider this and look at different ways to bring in the skill set we need. As I mentioned, my degree, in accounting uh, led me to be an auditor. And being an auditor, I was at the government, is where I learned to ask questions and write. Auditors write a lot. And what I've learned after 13 years in information security, I, we write a lot as well. As a consultant, I write reports and deliverables. I have to write recommendations. I have to be able to communicate in email. I have to be able to communicate orally. And I learned all of that, or a lot of that at least, through being an auditor. And that was led to by my accounting degree. And then my computer forensics taught me how to solve puzzles, how to ask more questions, think creatively, how to find the needle in the haystack, some patience. And yes, as I mentioned, it had some elements of computers, but nothing from the security perspective did not prepare me at all for the technical work I do now. And the work I've been doing now for 13 years which I gained on the job. I was hired, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but I was hired uh, to do Sarbanes-Oxley testing in 2005, when that was really, really the kind of the new thing. And the guys that hired me were IT guys, and they wanted to do this consulting, and they understood what it took, 
but they really didn't know what an audit was or how to do an audit, how to write a work paper, some of the nuances that I knew, but I knew nothing about firewalls, Active Directory, anything. I had so many words flying at me. I had no clue what was happening. I was taking a lot of notes, asking a lot of questions behind the scenes outside of the client environment. And they were great. They answered my questions. They told me what to ask for. They helped me interpret the evidence that came back. And I learned as I went. And I realized very quickly that this is something I could do. But they gave me that opportunity. And I think one of our bigger challenges is the fact that a lot of organizations don't think about how great it can be if you bring someone in and mentor them and help them get to where they need to be. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But from an educational perspective, we also need to think about educating younger folks. So if we want more women in this industry, we have to get in front of them when they're still young, when they're still probably in elementary school, maybe middle school, definitely high school, entering college, and not just in front of them, but their parents, the guidance counselors, the career counselors, the principals, their teachers, to help everybody understand that you don't need a computer science degree, you don't need the technical background to enter this amazing industry that has all these job opportunities. But that being said, we also need to make sure that if you're a hiring manager or you're working with HR to bring people in, that you are also willing to bring people in who have diverse educational backgrounds. We can't go out telling people that if you want to be a journalist or get a journalism degree or an English degree or an arts degree, you could definitely get a job in cybersecurity if the hiring side of, of the equation isn't doing that. So it's going to take two parts on the education, educating hiring managers, who I'm sure we have many of on the phone today, leaders, folks that have influence within your organization to hire differently. And we have people on the phone today who are possibly parents of kids that aren't thinking technical or they their neighbor works at the school and they can help educate them about why this field is great for just about anybody depending on the job assuming that we can get people to understand the hiring necessity around this so if we can help educate those folks coming up through growing up into what these jobs can look like that aren't as technical we need auditors and assessors and uh, technical writers we need analysts you know gartner's going to need people and other analytical groups need people the certification bodies need trainers and teachers so someone may love to teach and train maybe teaching and training within the space is where they should be writing curriculum so people who have um, learning theory degrees i'm not sure what the actual degree is i think it's pretty cool though we need people who can do all kinds of different things, uh, but they don't know that we need them because I don't think we're out there explaining that, talking about that. And that's something that we have to do as a community. That's something that if you are passionate about our industry and you can speak to a principal, to a teacher, to some kids, to parents and help them understand that our industry has all these job opportunities in the future, I don't think we're going anywhere. I'm pretty sure the internet's here to stay, that web applications are here to stay, that the attackers are here to stay, that we need people to defend the network, to protect us, to develop the next greatest, latest you know, um, tools to make our work easier and to help us spread the message. So that's why I'm kind of really honing in on this topic right now because I do feel it's really important and it's going to take all of us because we need the hiring managers to look differently at who they're hiring. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But we also need people graduating to understand that this industry is for them as well. This is something I absolutely love talking about when we talk about skills. Everybody comes to the table with different skills. And it really comes down to what particular skills does the position need? So let's talk about hiring. Let's talk about a position and writing a job description and what that position really needs. Many cybersecurity positions require a lot of writing and documentation. As I mentioned, if you do assessments, if you're doing Sarbanes-Oxley, PCI, any kind of audit work, any kind of security posture work, 
there's a lot of writing policies and procedures if you're doing GRC. There's a lot of writing and documentation that's at the heart of some of these jobs. Do we need a good writer or do we need someone super technical? And if it's the writer that's important, then let's look at journalism degrees. Let's look at English degrees and writers. Let's look at people who have been writers in a previous career and maybe now are looking for a new experience. Do you may, as I mentioned, find it easier to teach a writer about security than to teach your IT expert how to write? I was an auditor who was really, really good at auditing and was able to learn security. It's not always the same. You can't always teach a security expert how to audit. So what are the underlying skills that you need for the position? Do you need someone who's really great in, um, in difficult situations? Do you need someone who's really great when there's a lot of stuff coming at them and competing priorities and politics and just all kinds of frenzied activity, which you may have in a SOC or you may have on an incident response team or in different areas of the environment? Well, what about somebody who has a military background or as a, was a police officer is really good at dealing with all of that that's happening around them and versus somebody who likes to um, put puzzles together. The idea of someone who can sit quietly for hours working on puzzles is someone who could potentially sit for hours looking for a needle in a haystack within the sim. Those are very different skills and very different um, personalities, which I'm actually gonna talk about here next. And I think the whole idea of skills is really important because it's not just an IT background or IT folks that make good security professionals. IT professionals are good at IT. They're good at keeping the database up and running. They're good at keeping everything connected. Now, if they've gone and furthered their IT education, they may have some good security knowledge as well. But just because someone's got a strong technical background and knows how to code, doesn't mean they've ever been trained how to code securely. And we need to make sure that we're not just looking at who we hire from this, I need someone with technical skills. We really need to dissect the job. What skills do I need? What's the underlying need of the position? And uh, can I bring someone in with that underlying skill and teach them the cyber piece, the security piece? Can I send them to a boot camp? Can I take them for you know the first few weeks and, and put them in a course? Can I can I partner them with someone on the team as a mentor? What are my options? And I think when you do that, you really your your team becomes very diverse and very interesting. And really, that's a, a big piece of what we're looking to have happen here. As I mentioned, I think personality is really exciting. As I was mentioning on the last slide with skills, if chaos is at the heart of the position, we need someone who thrives in chaos. That could be a personality trait versus someone who is quiet and solitary and likes to think internally. The introvert versus extrovert conversation. Introverts often really just get energy from being alone and solving things internally. Well, that's great for certain positions. And that that um, extrovert who loves talking and loves to be the life of the party and all of that is great for building relationships. When we work in security, oftentimes there is, there is an odds between what our priorities are and what the business's priorities are. The business wants to make things easy for the users and the customers and they wanna put out this new great shiny thing and this new tool and this new application and we want it to be done securely. And often we're looked at as the department of no, but we need to be able to build relationships so that when the business has a new idea, they think of us first and they come to us. So we need personalities on our security team that can build those relationships. It doesn't have to be everybody on the team. Again, it has to be diverse. But do we have anyone on the team who can go out there and advocate and be the um, the and evangelize our department, what we do? And that's a personality trait. That's something that's really important and something that's hard to put in a job description potentially. But be creative. Think about what is it this position needs. This particular position needs to interact with the business. Well, this other position does not write those positions to the people who are going to look at it and say, oh, wow, that's me. Not just a laundry list of 
tools that you've used, certifications that you have, your education, number of years of experience in a very particular field. I see job descriptions. They want 15 years of experience in business continuity and five years of experience in governance and 10 years of experience. And I'm like, who are you looking for? Who has all of that number of years of experience in those things? What is it about those, those positions that you need? Someone who can deal with chaos, someone who's super organized, someone who can put the pieces, the puzzle together, someone who can build a relationship. What is it that you need? Speak to that. And of course, you want to determine, you know, what their experience is, have the conversation. If you've got two people with very similar personalities that will fit the role, does one person have more technical knowledge, more experience than the other, a certification that you think is important? But those should be what comes secondary, not the primary thing we're looking for. So I love personality. A lot of assessment tools out there. There are a lot of great ones. Um, they can be very interesting and very insightful. They can also be excellent for the team you already have to help diversify who does what. By using some of these tools, you start to understand who is really wired to do what kind of work. And you can even do that through conversation, asking everyone on your team, what is it that you love doing? And what is it that if you never had to do again, you would be really happy about? And then you start to learn that maybe some people are in the wrong role within your team and a small shift in responsibility might spark a whole new um, life into them. And you might end up with a team player that you thought didn't have what they needed to have and you weren't sure what you were going to do with them. And all of a sudden, because you made a small shift in the type of work they do, they've come alive. So I think this is one of those areas that is overlooked very often and I just want to tell you that it's really such an interesting and important area, especially when we're talking about diversification. We all know certifications. Everyone on this call probably has a certification. You're here with EC Council who has fantastic certifications. I have one currently from them. They, I've had my CEH. I go to Hackers Halted. I, I love everything that they're doing. So if you're on this call, you probably know that certifications are important and they hold an important place in the industry. One thing I've seen is they often are being used as a requirement for people to enter a position. And the area that I caution that in is that we may be missing out on the artists and the journalists and the auditors who don't have the certifications yet, but have the skills, have the knowledge or have the thirst and are more than happy to get certified and get the education when they're given the opportunity, the caution I have is when it's on the requirement for the job. As a often, often HR will do keyword searches on job resumes, on applications, and they're looking for these certifications because it was part of the requirement. We may be weeding out people who are excellent candidates who we don't even have a conversation with because they don't have the certificate. I think certifications are great on the part of the job description where it's a nice to have. That's how I got that first job. I was looking for a job in computer forensics because that's what I got a degree in. So I typed it in to Monster in 2005 and I got a job back where the computer forensics piece was on the nice to have list, not the required list. I literally didn't meet any of the requirements on the required list, but applied anyway because the word computer forensics showed up and they did give me that chance. I did have something they were looking for. But when it becomes a requirement, I think we miss people who are happy to get the certifications later, but won't get the opportunity to even be interviewed. So we really need to think, do they need to have a certification for the job? In some cases they might, but if it's not a hard and fast requirement for the job, I would say move it to the area where it's, yeah, this is a nice to have. Use it as the, maybe you're deciding between two people who have the skills, have the personality, have the drive, and now you're trying to decide which one do I hire. Maybe that does make a difference. But when we use it as a potential barrier of entry, we miss out on really great diversity. So I just want to say certifications are great and we need to use them correctly in terms of hiring. So think differently about certifications. And then really what I want to end with here is what's really important. What are we really trying to do? 
instead of searching for that perfect cybersecurity employee with the specific skill set, the technical background, the knowledge of a particular tool or a particular industry with X number of years of experience, let's look at the less obvious sources for hiring your next cybersecurity employee or building your team. Let's look at the artists, the accountant, the liberal arts majors, the writers, the veterans, the gamers, people who have the way of thinking that we need, have the skills that we need or the personality that we need that can be trained, can be mentored, can get their certifications, can do some higher education, who are hungry to learn. I have found that when people work for organizations who feed them with knowledge, who empower them to go to training and get certifications and go to conferences, those are more loyal employees. You taught them something, they're going to stay with you. They're not going to just take that information and run away. They really appreciate the fact that you believed in them and you encouraged them. So I want to encourage you to think about how do we hire differently? What's really important for the position? How do we give opportunities to these people who are really hungry? I'm hearing about all these job openings, and I'm also hearing how hard it is to get your foot in the door. And there's a big disconnect here. Why do we have so many positions open and at the same time have so many people who want to come in and can't get in because they don't have the, their cert yet? but they're willing to get it or don't have the exact degree or the number of years of experience um, for the job. What is What do we really need? What's really important? I received complete on the job training for my first solid year as a consultant. And I'll tell you, I knew nothing, but they, they trusted me. They saw me learning. They kept giving me more stuff, more responsibility. And I just kept going with it. And I, I worked with those guys over the years um, for a while. It was really, really exciting. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't be here. I thank them on a regular basis. And you can do that as well. If you're the hiring manager or if you're working into a leadership position, you can do that for someone as well. So what I really want to leave you with here is a call to action, especially if you're a hiring manager. Can you change the job description? Can you change the narrative? Do you have to work with HR? Then work with HR. Find a way within your organization to be the change that we need. And that is going to be really key in bringing people in because if, if the job descriptions I read, if you don't have a technical background, there it's like reading Greek or Latin or something you don't, and language you don't speak. And if we can change that job description to be read and understood in a way that the, that the writer, the auditor, the accountant, the economist, the history major can say, ooh, I could do that, or potentially I could do that, we're going to see this amazing diversity. Be a mentor. I know everybody's busy. We all have jobs that keep us away from our families and we're busy. Find the time to mentor someone at work or maybe outside of work to help them get into the industry. But if you're the hiring manager, can, do you see a diamond in the rough that you can bring in and mentor like my guys mentored me? They may not have realized what they were doing. They may not have done it purposely, but they really made a huge impact in my career and where I am today. Do you want to do that for somebody else? Can you be that person? I know I didn't really speak about soft skills that much in this talk. I, I speak about it often in other other presentations I give, but soft skills, I talked about it a little bit in terms of building relationships and communication, obviously writing, but things like emotional intelligence, listening, being able to have a conversation with the business and hear what they need and help align the security with their goals, understanding what that looks like, being able to have these conversations, our soft skills, being able to you know, um, handle adversity, soft skills. So we didn't really talk about that today, but I do want to leave you with the idea and the, the thought from a call to action perspective that the soft skills are really important and hard to teach. Oftentimes we need someone who already has those soft skills. So we can teach them the technical stuff. Don't set the bar too high by saying I need 10 years of experience in this and five years in that and these three certs and this uh, level of education for something that might be a mid-level position or even an entry-level position. Don't set the bar too high where you can potentially bring in other folks. Obviously, you want to have standards. You want to bring in good, qualified people. 
but I'm seeing these job descriptions that are looking for one person that's out there out of a million. And I've heard of people who've had job openings available for a year or more uh, because they're, they've set the bar too high and there's great candidates out there. They're just missing out on the, on the possibilities. And remember the personality, my big call to action is really understanding the personality, the position needs. Each job has its own personality that it needs. Some jobs need that really loud, outspoken personality, and others need the quiet, the analytical. Some positions need the, the creative, the PowerPoint person. If you really do a lot of presentations, maybe you need someone who's really creative with a marketing background. Or maybe you need someone analytical that can just analyze spreadsheets and do pivot tables and all of this other stuff. Uh, but know the personality of the position. Those are my real call to action. Uh, those are that's my call to action for any hiring managers or HR folks, anyone out there who has the opportunity to change the direction and how we hire. I've really enjoyed my time with you today. I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, EC Council. I love what you guys are doing. I'll be at Hackers How. I'll be at Hackers Halted and the Global CISO Forum this year, speaking at both. Really excited to be there. Was there last year. It's, an, it's a fantastic event. Uh, and I really just appreciate you guys having me out here today. Thank you so much.